Uh, good evening, everyone. You're all very welcome to the first in the National Archives online public lecture series for 2021. Uh, my name is Elizabeth McAvoy and I'm the archivist with responsibility for education and outreach in the National Archives. And on behalf of the office, we're delighted to welcome you here tonight and also to welcome our speaker, Dr. Michael Kennedy, who will enlighten us on the fate of the records of the Department of External Affairs during the Second World War. But before we begin, I'll run through just a few housekeeping details so that you can engage with our event. Audience cameras are off and mics are muted, but we do encourage your participation in tonight's talk using the webinar's Q&A function. Michael's talk will run for approximately 45 minutes with 10 minutes for Q&A at the end. And you'll have the opportunity to submit your questions during the talk. So please just type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of the control panel, as we will not be monitoring the chat box for them. We'll accommodate as many questions as time permits. So apologies in advance if we don't get around to answering yours. We are recording this webinar and we will be making it available after the event. We're also live tweeting the talk tonight. So please like or retweet our posts at NAR Ireland. And if you don't already follow us on Twitter, well, tonight's your chance. So a few words about tonight's talk. Michael's lecture will explore one of the enduring legends in the history of Irish foreign policy, namely that during the Second World War, large portions of the Department of External Affairs archive were destroyed in May 1940, when it was feared that Ireland might be invaded by one or the other of the Axis or Allied powers who were then at war. Michael will look at the facts behind the legend and put the destruction that did take place in the context of emergency planning for state treasures and official archives during the Second World War. And as for our speaker tonight and his myriad accomplishments, Michael is the executive editor of the Royal Irish Academy's Documents on Irish Foreign Policy series. In addition to editing 12 volumes of the DIFP, he has published widely for over 25 years on Irish diplomatic, political and military history. And his most recent books include the Emergency, a visual history of the Irish Defence Forces, 1939 to 45, with Commandant Daniel Iotis and Dr. John Gibney. Ireland, a voice among the nations, with Dr. John Gibney and Dr. Kate O'Malley. And Ireland, the United Nations and the Congo, with Commandant Art McGuinness. Michael also appears on radio and TV and talks regularly to a wide variety of audiences on aspects of modern Irish history. So, the coming generations would reproach us for not taking all the available precautions. The destruction and preservation of the records of the Department of External Affairs during the Second World War. And it is over to you, Michael. Thank you very much, Elizabeth, and, and good evening, everybody. Um, I've also asked that Elizabeth give me a 10 minute warning uh, before my time is up so that I can bring the paper to uh, a conclusion in the proper time and that uh, I don't uh, talk for more than the time we have allotted and we can we can explore other topics in the Q&A. I'm going to just share my screen here now. And now you should be able to see the PowerPoint that I'll, I'll use as the basis of the talk tonight. So Elizabeth has set the, the theme that I want to talk about, and it's that um, legend uh, amongst historians of Irish foreign policy in, in the 1990s, just after the department's archive was released, and also among some officers of the department and, and retired at the time ministers. I remember Garrett Fitzgerald saying to me that they had no idea uh, what the exact extent of the Department of Foreign Affairs archive was. And I think what had happened was that um, the stories of destruction, and there was destruction, and that's what I'll be talking about in this paper, uh, these stories were compounded by initial problems in the, in the listing of files, uh, disconnected series of, of releases of papers, but I think above all, a lack of understanding amongst 
uh, historians of Irish foreign policy in the 1990s about how the department's registry and archives operated and how files were migrated uh, when there were working files, how they were migrated between uh, collections, between sections within the department. So uh, these contributed to a widespread misunderstanding of the extent of the destruction that took place in 1940. But though files were destroyed, uh, what happened was being good civil servants, the officials who destroyed the files left a paper trail of their pyromania. And picking up the trail over 70, 70 years later, what I tried to do was to look at um, the trail that they left, the debris trail that we left. Now, we know very little about, uh, or we have very few internal pictures of the Department of External Affairs during the Second World War, but here's one from the, the embassy in Stockholm, uh, a, a very young Robert McDonough, uh, later to be Secretary General of the Department, with some files and uh, with, in, the, in the, the registry of the, the embassy in Stockholm. So, although this is a post-war picture, it's one of the few pictures that we have a diplomat at work within the department. So what I tried to do was compile a record of what was destroyed, when it was destroyed, and I, the, the aim was trying to find out what exactly the destruction was. And the resulting list of files, and I won't be going through it in detail tonight, uh, but it's in uh, Documents in Irish Foreign Policy volumes five, six, and seven as an appendix at the back of the volume. And you can see in detail in that what we discovered as a result of this. And I think as a result of the, this bit of forensic historical work, uh, what we were able to show was that the uh, destruction was probably far less than what was, uh, what was uh, anticipated. And we can show with greater certainty, with full certainty, I think, what was destroyed. So really what I wanna do in this paper is go behind the scenes of, those, of that appendix in the volumes of DIFP and do a bit of forensic archival work, forensic historical analysis, and try and contextualize the destruction of the archives within the events that were taking place between, say, the Munich crisis of uh, September 1938 and the, the outbreak of the war in September 1939 and the invasion scares of 1940. And I was trying to work out what the, the context and the rationale for the destruction of papers was, and that brought me into the wider concept of emergency planning in Ireland in the run-up to the Second World War. And we tend to scoff at the Second World War in Ireland, the emergency. Uh, we think of the glimmer man of the turf uh, camps or the turf piles in the Phoenix Park and cross-border smuggling of butter in, you know, in people's raincoats and that kind of thing. But I think anyone who's read the emergency defence plans, files in military archives will see the more serious side. And the decisions and the actions that I want to discuss below were all taken in the context of a possible invasion of Ireland, uh, almost certainly a German one, but plans were made to counter a British invasion across the border too. And in the doomsday scenario of a German invasion, uh, with the defence forces putting up what little resistance they could to the Wehrmacht, who would most likely be arriving uh, via uh, an amphibious landing along the Cork coast to Ross Lair, and in coordinated parachute drops at strategic locations, and with the linked aerial uh, bombing raids, uh, particularly across central Dublin. If that were to happen, Cabinet Secretary Maurice Moynihan would take this cabinet agenda uh, from the secure envelope that it was in, and it would be circulated to cabinet ministers by dispatch rider. They would be brought together at, uh, we don't know what location, but at a hopefully secure location, and they would take, uh, they would undertake what would be the last cabinet minute meeting in, in Ireland before uh, the defence forces well, were engaged or the British were, were brought across the border. This is a very, very important document. It's still in its envelope in the National Archives. Uh, thankfully, it was never used uh, because, as we know, the, the fear for invasion never took place. By this stage, Moynihan and his colleagues and the cabinet feared that central Dublin would have been heavily bombed and German parachutists would be landing to take over strategic locations like Dublin Airport, power stations, pumping stations. And on the expected list of casualties were government buildings itself, the National Library, the National Gallery, the National Museum, and my own employer, the Royal Irish Academy. The defense forces expected that the Germans would arrive in between these two lines. You can see a sort of donut there, uh, the outer perimeter and the inner defense perimeter. And it's within the context of uh, a German invasion of Ireland that I want to uh, fix my, my paper tonight. The scenario is something is going to happen. There is going to be an invasion. And I want to start by looking at how the Irish government and administration prepared to protect state records. 
uh, as war in Europe loomed, and then proceed to look at how the Department of Foreign Affairs said they would protect their records and ultimately how they devised their own uh, means of keeping state secrets safe to stop them falling into German hands, and that's by burning them. So to start, looking at the, the period from 1938 uh, into towards May 1940. In December 1938, Taoiseach and Minister for External Affairs, Eamon de Valera, presided over a meeting of the Cabinet Emergency Committee, uh, the Cabinet Committee on Emergency Measures, to establish the steps necessary to protect state documents against possible loss or damage resulting from air attack on Dublin. Now, an air attack was a real possibility. De Valera was personally terrified of the idea of a, an air attack on Dublin based on what he knew about bombings by air during the Spanish Civil War. Dublin had very limited air defences here. You can see some of the, uh, the heavy uh, anti-aircraft guns around the city, and you can see there in white the strategic geopolitical locations uh, in the centre of the city as well. And you, we all know, I guess, the locations of the, the cultural institutions I've just referred to. Defence of the city was by uh, Vickers 3.7-inch anti-aircraft guns. These were state-of-the-art at the time. Uh, very, very modern equipment. Uh, staple of British air defence during the Second World War. This is not out of date. Um, the problem with the, the defence of Dublin was that the defence forces had very few of them. The orders had gone into the UK too late and uh, the massive number of them that uh, de Valera had, had ordered while acting Minister for Defence never turned up. The scenario which was expected was an air attack down the line of the Liffey and the uh, four uh, anti-aircraft batteries would try and engage the incoming German aircraft who would already have their bomb doors open as they crossed into Dublin Bay uh, down the line of the Liffey, and there would be uh, it was anticipated huge damage in the city centre. If you can remember the sort of uh, damage that even uh, one aircraft dropping bombs on the North Strand did, you get an idea of, of what was expected. Well, the documentation prepared for the uh, protection of state papers by the Cabinet Committee, the programme to protect state papers was supervised by the Department of Finance. The department contacted other departments of state to gauge the nature and the extent of documents requiring safekeeping. And finance asked these departments whether they had, as, as uh, Memo put it, documents of such importance that their destruction would be a national loss or would seriously impede government administration. But as befits the ethos in the Department of Finance, the curtailing of expenditure on this process was more significant than the actual protection of the material itself. Finance explained that effective protection for such documents by way of underground storage accommodation or otherwise would involve considerable expense. And departments were exhorted instead to apply a very strict test in deciding which documents are of such a nature that the government should be advised to take special measures to safeguard them. And that's what I want to look at for the next few minutes. The solution suggested was to duplicate documents of national importance, photocopy them effectively, and store the duplicates, quote, at a place which might be regarded as reasonably immune from the danger of air attack. So we'll go on to look at where that was uh, shortly. Now, departments were very slow to respond to this request. And after uh, two weeks, the Secretary of the Department of Finance, JJ McElligot, you can see him there on the, uh, the left of the, the, the picture, uh, staring at the camera with the, uh, the thick frame glasses. Um, McElligot minuted that he had received only six, uh, six replies and nine are still outstanding. Departments obviously had other priorities, understandably, and uh, compared to the autumn of 1938 and the Munich crisis in December, war now appeared unlikely in the short run. And at the Department of External Affairs, no record remains on file of any action being taken to comply with McElligot's request. McElligot had privately minuted that he was somewhat alarmed at the probable cost of the measures for the preservation of official records. Finance thus would try, as he put it, to ascertain a method which combines cheapness with efficiency and use it uniformly throughout the service. To see what might be done, they contacted their usual problem solvers, the Treasury in London. And the Treasury replied also that duplicating files was um, practically impossible due to the sheer bulk of paper. Uh, instead, due to the duplication of material between files, quote, reconstruction of the essential parts would be possible unless both sets of such files were destroyed. Such files would have to take their chance and they would be stored in safe locations. Where no duplicates existed, 
and where reconstruction would be extremely expensive, photographic copies were being made and cameras were being hired from Kodak who also possessed the film, processed, I should say, the film. And the Department of Finance thus followed the Treasury's advice. And in the summer of 1939, they hired a Recordac, Record and Kodak, Recordac, a Recordac microfilling machine using 16 millimeter film. And uh, they hired it and uh, Kodak came along to a room that was set aside in Beggar's Bush Barracks for filming. So I wanted to find out what a Recordac machine was. And initially I thought it was something like this. You can see there Recordac. And these two ladies are sorting documents and putting them into what looks like a little slot on the machine there. But if you see under Recordac, it says accounting by photography. So I gather this was some sort of a machine that photographed um, uh, bills or some sort of punch cards that went in um, old fashioned calculators or something, something like that. So I guess it couldn't have been that. And then I happened across this, and I think this is more what we're, we're looking at. There's, uh, you can see the, the photographic apparatus there on the, the left with the sort of triangular uh, lighting frame coming out of it. And then on the right, uh, a microfilm reader. I was going to say a very a primitive microfilm reader, but then I guess in the age we're in now, all microfilm readers are primitive of their nature. And I think this was the sort of material that the department uh, had in mind. What they were doing was they were using 16 millimeter uh, film stock, making archive reduced scale copies uh, of paper documents. And then there was a facility for printing from 16 millimeter originals uh, to make the hard copies very slow ASA rating. And those of you interested in photography will know that that leads to a very fine grain image. I also found this uh, from 1942. It's an American picture and it's worth showing if only for the wonderful uh, spats, I think that the, the, the three gentlemen are wearing there while Vice Admiral unnamed uh, looks, uh, looks on there. If, if anything, that picture is worth showing just for male fashion, the, uh, the, inter, or the, the, the wartime period. I think it's the 27th of July. That picture was taken. So that's the sort of equipment we're looking at. And this, I think, was the kind of uh, advertising at the time that was to suggest what uh, benefits you might get from, from microfilming. It's a really badly staged picture, as you can gather. And the, uh, the two people in the picture look like they really hate each other and they're being forced to do this. Uh, but you can see there, before and after, microfilming is a good thing, particularly if you want to try and store large amounts of valuable documents in a small space. So on the 29th of August, 1939, just before the outbreak of the war, the Department of Finance returned to the question of the protection of records, just leaving it till the last minute. Heads of departments were contacted and they were made responsible for the choice of the documents to be protected. Finance warning that only essential records of which no duplicates exist uh, and which to construct would be unduly expensive should be copied generally by photographic means. Now, having already provided the Department of Finance with equipment, uh, Kodak now went on the hard sell to promote the purchase of further Recordac machines. And the uh, wonderfully named Daniel O'Connell of Kodak wrote to the Minister for Finance, Sean McAtee, it's like the older picture of him here, and a younger picture of McElligot. Uh, O'Connell wrote to McEntee that Kodak were aware that one of the problems confronting the government at the present time is the, the preservation of important books and documents. Safe, safe storage was not enough. Documents could be destroyed even in the safest of places. And O'Connell wrote, if such a calamity occurred, surely the coming generations would reproach us for not taking all the available precautions. Driving the point home further, O'Connell continued to McEntee that if the apparatus available uh, today was available and used when the forecourts were blown up, how many priceless treasures would have been saved? Now, presumably he meant before the forecourts were blown up, but you get the picture. He concluded, put your treasures on miniature film and beejitly. And McEntee, being an engineer, his engineering background asserted itself, and he was hooked. External affairs and other departments were informed that the Minister for Finance is of the opinion that this would be a rather good idea if time permitted. To which McElligot, seeing also that the Kodak letter suggested that all government documents and books should be photographed, minuted simply, God forbid. So McEntee ultimately emphasized to secretaries of all departments to restrict the reproduction of documents uh, which cannot be released from their offices 
and the destruction of which would be a national loss and cause really grave difficulties in the administration. And it seemed in the Department of the Taoiseach, at least, that nobody had really ever gone through the, by now, uh, 11,000 files, S files, this is much later file, you'll see, uh, the 11,000 files in the department's registry. Uh, S files, standing for Sarah's thought, they run from S1, kind of handover of power in 1922, and they keep going. And this is a file from 1964-ish Cyprus, UN peacekeeping that you can see they're up to 16, uh, 1,230. So nobody had gone through these, uh, the, the files that had been collected in the Department of Strong Rooms, and most documents of historical interest had, the department noted, never been catalogued or even examined. So when the Taoiseach's department examined their registry, the results were really surprising. Rationally, Cabinet Secretary Morris Moylan considered that the destruction of any of our documents would undoubtedly cause considerable inconvenience. The majority are not irreplaceable. And due to duplication, the Taoiseach's department cut the number of S files that might be preserved very fine, and they came to a list out of that 11,000 files of 51, which comprised 105 cubic feet of documents, to which were added 145 cubic feet of military service pensions files. And you can see here uh, just how fine they cut it into the Department of the Taoiseach. We don't have uh, equivalent papers for the Department of Foreign Affairs, External Affairs. Uh, you can work down through them there and see uh, what I'm talking, the kind of uh, documents they had in mind or boxes they had in mind. The numbers on the left are boxes rather than uh, individual files. The Department of Finance exhorted that the greatest care was to be taken to preserve documents that showed the development and execution of policy. And in ensuring this, as they put it, departments should keep well on the safe side. It was of the utmost importance to preserve records of value for historical and for other reasons. The search in the Taoiseach's department that I've described here was replicated across most government departments, and it seems that the emergency preparations really were becoming the first serious trawl of state papers by the independent Irish government uh, since 1922. Civil servants gave higher priority to documents from the 1919 to 22 period than for those from post-1922, uh, possibly because copies of these latter files were more widely available. Non-essential records of national value uh, were to be prepared for removal at short notice through liaison with the OPW. Now, as far as the Department of External Affairs was concerned, this process didn't take place. A letter to the Secretary of the Department of External Affairs, Joseph Walsh, on the 23rd of October 1939, and I show pictures of Walsh here. Uh, you might be forgiven initially for thinking it's a different man. It's uh, Walsh in 1939 and Walsh in 1945. And you can see the impact that the Second World War had on him, uh, Secretary General of the Department of External Affairs, that the, the stress and the strain really shows the comparatively young man on the right and the, uh, the, the much more tired, uh, less uh, happy looking man on the, on the, the right hand side there, uh, graying hair, and that makes it quite clear. Well, Walsh was asked in October 1939 that to furnish immediately to the OPW the information requested with regard to the document types and the boxes required. Uh, but the letter was overlooked. The department was working at a frantic pace in the months leading up to the uh, and after the outbreak of the war, and it would do so until the autumn of 1940. The letter, misplaced and ignored in 1939, was later found in November 1941 on the desk of John Belton, uh, Assistant Principal Officer in the department. A final request sent on the 24th of May 1940, a date that will become very important later, requested the Department of External Affairs to take immediate notice to ensure that the boxes containing documents will be ready for removal at short notice. But here a problem arose. The Department of Defense would not transport these documents by military lorries. They said they needed them to transport troops. Neither would the Department of Defense commandeer public transport in the event of, the, of an emergency, like an invasion. So this left the Department of Finance to instruct departments to negotiate with the Great Southern Railways or other carriers for the removal of boxes when required. And the GSR said that they could probably do this and move material by road within 24 hours. The question now arises, where were they going to move the documents to? And that brings us on to secure locations outside Dublin. The May 1940 request leads us onto the, the question I want to look at now. 
And one source gives an insight. Interdepartmental destructions discussions in December 1938 and January 1939 plan to safeguard the national treasures stored in the National Library, the National Museum and the National Gallery. And amongst the representatives from the Department of Education, the National Library, the Gallery, uh, Finance, OPW and the Department of Justice was Dr. Adolf Maher of the National Museum, uh, a Nazi party member who left Ireland for Germany at the outbreak of the war. So presumably Maher's presence at these meetings compromised planning from the start. The meetings decided that at least 14,000 cubic feet of uh, space would be required and consideration would have to be given to a further 30,000 cubic feet required for the storage of irreplaceable newspapers from the National Library. Rehousing would be provided for in a sufficiently sized building, quote, in good repair, free from damp and centrally heated. Air conditioning was necessary for the rooms in which the paintings of the National Gallery would be hung. The building should be a state building and as far removed from the danger zone as possible. Uh, outside the 40 mile radius which the Department of Defense set down as the radius for evacuating citizens uh, from uh, the, the capital. Well, after discussions in which Mukras Abbey in Killarney was ruled out, eventually the Kalashtamwira Preparatory College in Termakidi was decided upon as the most suitable premises. Uh, one of the reasons suggested to me by, uh, suggested by Deirdre McMahon uh, was that um, Eamon and Sinead de Valera had both attended Irish courses here uh, earlier in their life and they, Deirdre said maybe they were there for their engagement or they met there or something like this, but there was a, a, a link to the Taoiseach in the whole thing. In 1939, the school had 61 students, was run by a community of nuns, and on inspection the college was found to be in excellent repair, very dry and centrally heated. Material from the National Library and the National Museum would be stored on the ground floor uh, on the southwest wing. This contained a library, a reception room and a study hall. And we get some idea from this um, uh, blueprint here of some of the other work that was planned uh, using classrooms to convert them into storage areas. You can see midway down there in the blue portion under the word room, they're discussing or they're writing in uh, how many boxes could be stored in what area. And then we get an idea from this blueprint, the type of boxes uh, that would be would be used and, and all these are uh, these pictures are from some of the, the wonderful files that Elizabeth and her colleagues have in the, the National Archives. So pictures from the National Gallery would be stored on the first floor in a dormitory. Uh, the wing would be cut off from the remainder of the building. Uh, the classroom that you saw there a moment ago uh, had enough space for 30,000 uh, 30, cubic feet of documents and it would be made available for government documents which it was felt would fill uh, two and a half thousand cubic feet. To give an air of normality, life in the college would continue as normal when the materials were deposited. Officials from the institutions involved would be transferred to Mayo and would live nearby, uh, looking after material while it was stored there. An adequate guard was required, uh, and while an official would be on duty day and night within the college, it was proposed that the defense forces would guard the college. But it was also considered that the occupation of the building by the nuns would be an added advantage and in the nature of an added protection. The decision was overtaken somewhat when the Cabinet Committee on Emergency Problems decided in June 1940 that instead of removing all the national treasures and uh, important government documents to Termakidi, a selection should be made of the most valuable treasures and these would be deposited in the Bank of Ireland on College Green right in the middle of where the Germans were expected to bomb. Although, um, you know, th this is the way planning goes, I suppose. Uh, by August 1941, rather than being attacked by the Germans, it was found that the pictures that were stored in the vaults of the Bank of Ireland had bloomed badly. Uh, they got damp and then mold, I guess. And the director and governors of the National Gallery insisted on the strongest terms that the pictures should instead be hung in a safe house uh, a house a suitable safe location away from the area. Uh, so the treasures were taken out of the, the bank on College Green. Uh, finally, someone realized that, of course, this is also within the target for an air attack on the country, so they'd better be moved. And their treasures were sent to uh, branches of the National Bank, the Royal Bank, and the Hibernian Bank, uh, the Munster and Leinster Bank around Ireland, who gave permission for their strong rooms to be used. 
Uh, and so the most valuable treasures from the gallery, the National Library and the museum ended up dispersed around the state's banking network. As for what was happening in Termikidi, finally, in February 1942, the Department of Education was fully authorized to send material to the Preparatory College. Pictures were transferred in the first weeks of June 1942. But for the gallery attendant assigned to look after the pictures in the college, the posting to Termikidi was effectively a hardship posting. After enduring almost a year in Termikidi, Thomas O'Leary wrote to the Registrar of the National Gallery for an increase in his miserly special allowance of one pound a week. He added, where I am staying is anything but comfortable, and I had to make big sacrifices during the last winter. If I wanted to write on the subject, I could write for two hours. But I was waiting, thinking the war might come to an end, but so far, no sign. The Department of Finance considered that O'Leary's weekly pay of four pounds and nine shillings, including the bonus and special allowance, was, as they put it, reasonable enough for the work he is doing in the circumstances in which he is employed. But they reckoned that if the National Gallery were satisfied with his application and they could find a saving elsewhere, that uh, he could be uh, given an increase. So when George Furlong, the director of the National Gallery, wrote again to the Department of Finance, requesting sanction for the increase, T.J. Morris at the Department of Finance noted that the request should have been in the form of an official minute, but one must not expect too much from the artistic temperament. Please prepare an official sanction. O'Leary got his increase, but he remained in Termikidi with the pictures until they were returned to the National Gallery in June 1945. And a kind of side about, um, about O'Leary was he was sent to Termikidi in the first place because it was felt best to uh, get him out of Dublin because officials knew that his marriage was on the rocks uh, and to send him to Termikidi to a girls boarding school was felt to be the best place uh, that, uh, that he could be sent. And so he was sent down there for the duration. So now to move on to the uh, Department of External Affairs. By the late 1930s, missions abroad were beginning to run out of space, run out of storage space. And in 1937, the Consulate General in, or the Consulate in New York queried from Dublin whether older records should be destroyed or there was additional space available outside the office. Seeking advice from the Department of Finance, the Department of External Affairs let slip that the procedures for dealing with old documents have not been uniform and the practice regarding them varies in different offices. In the passport office, papers were retained for 10 years. In other offices, papers were kept for seven years. And as we've seen, it was not until the Second World War that the Department of Finance returned to the question of document preservation and document destruction across the civil service. Now, we've looked at the issue of preservation already, and regarding destruction, paper shortage and uncertain future supplies led the Department of Finance to issue a circular on the destruction of records, which stated that steps must be taken to make available for conversion to paper pulp departmental records and documents, the preservation of which for the purposes either of future reference or transfer to the public record office is no longer essential. It was left to department heads to decide what was waste material. Some types of documents were suggested, such as receipts for returns of, or receipts for registered letters, returns of work, accounts vouchers. It was said that a, an inspection committee from the public record office and the National Library would uh, examine the documents earmarked for destruction, and then the documents would be disposed of by the stationary office. And in response to this request, the Department of External Affairs sent 117 files uh, from the interwar years to the stationary office following their uh, examination by First Secretary William Fay, who had just been in the department for uh, a year. It was only on the 28th of May 1940 that a man on Joe Walsh's right, holding the white gloves, uh, Nicholas Nolan, meticulous Nicholas, later go on to become secretary to the cabinet, um, that he received finances memo of May 19, uh, of the 24th of May. And it was then that external affairs seriously began to uh, consider the protection of documents and the safe storage of confidential material. When Nolan sought earlier documents from the registry on this matter, he minuted, there was no trace in the early, of the earlier Department of Finance letters. Not thinking of looking on John Belton's desk, Nolan's action as a good civil servant was to request copies of the files, uh, the papers, the missing papers from the Department of Finance, which he received by the 1st of June. And then having a file and all papers in hand, he decided it was time to make necessary arrangements to store important or essential documents. 
So the question now arose, what did the Department of External Affairs wish to preserve? Nolan minuted that the matter has now become one of some urgency. And he went around the various sides or the, the branches and sections in the department to find out what might be regarded as an, an important document and thus separated out for uh, preservation. All Nolan could think of himself was maybe the uh, recently ratified treaties and the like, and he hoped that Henry Kenny, the departmental archivist, uh, accountant, sorry, and the department's archivist, uh, Sheila Murphy, might be able to add to the list. Assistant Secretary Fred Boland said, well, maybe the Register of Nationals should go in there. And Sheila Murphy cautiously added the signet ring, fob seal, and originals of letters of credence and recall uh, were worth preserving. Uh, because of their historical interest. And she said, other than that, there's, there's nothing up, uh, uh, in my papers. Uh, the accountant said, the only documents I have of importance were staff records and vouchers, expense vouchers relating to current accounting work. John Belton was against storing the Register of Nationals, as he said, it was constantly required in the department, but he reckoned that it could be microfilmed. Uh, but he says, the film, the film cannot be read except through an apparatus known as a viewer. And this apparatus is costly. I do not imagine we will get one in this department. And he was right. Nolan arranged with Belton to have the register kept in a safe when it's not in actual use. So by July, uh, Sheila Murphy reported that the documents she had selected were ready for collection and storage. They were placed in the safe in John Belton's room, filed 226 in government buildings. Uh, the department wasn't in Ivy House uh, until the following May. Uh, they were listed and the safe now became the receptacle in the department uh, for uh, precious documents fulfilling the emergency measures required. And there they remained until 1945, when uh, after the war in Europe had ended and the documents becoming increasingly difficult to, to get to and it was inconvenient, uh, they were restored to their proper places. But there is another side to the story. And that's in May, 1940, 15th of May 1940 to be precise, Eamon de Valera, the Shaka Minister for External Affairs, directed that departments should be instructed informally by the Department of Finance to arrange immediately for the packing of all important documents which is desired to remove to a place of safety in case of emergency. De Valera would discuss personally with the Department of Education the packing and the removal uh, of, of these uh, documents. Taoiseach's and uh, finance uh, were informed in May 1940 that it was desire, the desire of the Taoiseach that an instruction be issued to departments as soon as possible to pack these boxes and hold them in readiness for removal. And after some discussion between the Department of Finance and uh, Moynihan, the Cabinet Secretary of the Department of the Taoiseach, it was decided there would be no action for the present. But it was agreed that what was called certain informal action was to take place. Now the details aren't given, but I'm going to talk about what I think they are in the remainder of the paper. And if I give you an idea of the context that these discussions are taking place in, it's the German invasion of France. It's the fear in May 1940 that after de Valera had made a speech in Galway, if I recall correctly, uh, in support of Belgium and the Netherlands after the German invasion of the Low Countries, and the negative response from Berlin to this, this speech, fear of invasion really rises in Ireland. The British-Irish military staff talks in the middle of May, it looks like Britain and Ireland are going to be Hitler's next target. The cabinet agrees to mobilize extra members of the defense forces. And German forces eventually reach the Atlantic coast. And you can see there that there's discussions about defense measures, military supplies, even a, a rumor uh, received from UK intelligence in Ireland that German naval and air forces are about to strike against Ireland. The 24th of May sees uh, operational order number one issued by the defence forces, uh, fear of uh, an imminent invasion along the southwest coast. This is also sparked by the uh, arrest of Stephen Held, uh, an IRA uh, agent, uh, uh, agent who's uh, interacting with the Germans and fear that there is collaboration. And this is the context within within which the destruction of portions of the Department of External Affairs archive takes place. On the 24th of May, right down at the bottom of the slide there, the British representative in Ireland, Sir John Maffey, received information from a private source, he never named it, that government departments in Dublin were busily engaged in burning secret papers on a large scale. 
He asked Assistant Secretary of the Department of External Affairs, Fred Boland, about this, and Boland said, yes, my, uh, he said that my information was correct. Uh, Maffey asked whether there were any special reasons for this action, since he had to consider his own archives, and they were to be destroyed later in the burning of the British Embassy in Dublin in 1972. Boland replied that Dublin had their eye on the possibility of Dublin undergoing the same experience as Oslo or The Hague, German forces coming in and state papers being uh, hoovered up by the um, arriving uh, Wehrmacht. And by Saturday, the 25th of May 1940, the Department of External Affairs was undertaking on its own initiative not to preserve, but to confidentially destroy files of compromising documents. Fred Boland later referred to this action as one of special precautions. For Nicholas Nolan, who we met a few moments ago, this was a special security matter. And as Maffey's quote that I, I mentioned earlier suggests, there had in fact been, uh, been earlier destruction uh, in, in the department. And what happened was that four third secretaries, T.J. Horan, Dennis MacDonald, Martina Flaherty, and Billy Butler, were tasked with the selection of general registry files for discussion and destruction. They received verbal instructions to select and destroy material from Walsh's private secretary, the department's archivist, that is, Sheila Murphy. And Sheila Murphy was told that it was decided that all files, the discovery of which might compromise us in the event of a German invasion, i.e. files dealing with our relations and contacts with the British, were to be destroyed. Murphy was acting on instructions contained in a letter from Morris Moynihan to select and destroy files. And Moynihan added at the end of his letter, his letter contained an instruction also to the effect that it too should be destroyed after reading. Sorry, Michael, you've ten got minutes. 10 minutes left there. Is that okay? is perfect. I have two pages Thank you. to go. Thank you very much. Horan's account of the destruction, written after consultation with John Belton and Sheila Murphy in 1968 as part of an attempt to write the history of the Department of External Affairs on its, its 50th anniversary, uh, is very explicit in detail. Horan said that he prefaced it with a general account of 1939 and, and 1940. Uh, he added that Ireland might very well be invaded by the Germans at the same time. Uh, Ireland and Britain might very well be invaded by the Germans at the same time. I remember quite well that there was a very real fear of this at that period. The four young diplomats were tasked to select files and the instruction was to be comply, uh, complied with right away. They worked alone, consulting each other, but not their senior officers, not Murphy, Nolan or Belton. And Nolan covered his involvement in the destruction of uh, the archives in a minute to Fred Boland in October 19. See here, he speaks about two occasions where registry files have been destroyed. First in mid-1940 as a security measure, that's what we're looking at here. And then second in December 1940 uh, as part of the waste paper drive, which I mentioned in passing earlier. And then he says in the, in the mid-1940 instance, the files were selected for destruction by the cadets, that's the, the third secretaries, which such supervision as Mr. Belton and myself could give, i.e. no supervision at all. Horan recalled that the task took about three weeks as it was carried out in addition to routine office work. He concluded that the period of destruction of the files uh, referred to was approximately from 1928 to 41, and he said about 50% of files were destroyed, and that's a, that's a huge uh, overestimation. Horan and his colleagues selected files for destruction based on their title in the register and examined them in a perfunctory manner. Uh, he said, there was no question certainly of reading carefully through the files and some files were marked for destruction merely on the basis of the title alone. Some harmless files were returned to the registry, but he wrote, files that I thought could in any way compromise us were marked with red pencil in the top right hand corner, CD. And this was what I was looking for in the registry of the files, the Clore Gems that remain in the department because like a good official, Horan, left a record of the destruction that took place. The files went to the, went to the incinerary, incinerator in government buildings and noted on the registry documents was whether a file had been destroyed or not. You can see there, confidential destroy and the date. And Horan unfortunately added, it's quite possible that files were destroyed and he would not have 
been destroyed. There was no real instruction given as to what uh, categories of files, and Horan said he acted on the principle of when in doubt, destroy. Uh, no list of the files destroyed was kept, and Horan uh, wrote later, certainly we made no such list, and that's what we tried to do in DIFP and uh, when we were doing the, the wartime volumes in documents in Irish foreign policy. The files known to have destroyed, which have been destroyed, which I'll come to now as I'm, I'm drawing things to a close, you can see there that the, the 100 and 200 series general registry files from the, the 1920s and 1930s uh, into the early 40s, 88 and 53 destroyed, files of confidential reports destroyed, and I'll, I want to look a little bit more at those, nine, nine very important files destroyed, and then an unknown quantity of the, the really top secret files in the department, Walsh's own files, the, the S uh, file series, we don't know how many of these were destroyed because some of these files that were of top secret classification were downgraded in terms of security status and were merged into the general registry, the 100, 200, and later the 300 and 400 and ongoing series. If we look at the destruction of confidential reports, this is a real loss to the history of Irish foreign policy. Uh, you can see there are files from, of confidential reports from Berlin, from Rome, you see the list there, really important material about the um, conduct of Irish foreign policy in Ireland's relations with the belligerent powers uh, in the run up to the war. There is a page from the registry itself, and you can see that what's actually given there uh, under confidential reports, you can see the, the date of the incoming document, where it was from, the file, it, 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 the it came from on Washington's side, a pricey of what was in the report, and then uh, who took the file, where it, where it went to and where it came from. And what we see, and I want to bring things to a, to a conclusion here, what we see from the destruction is that Horan and his colleagues destroyed files of documents that the Irish authorities feared would fall into German hands in the event of a German invasion of Ireland. And it's clear from what they destroyed that it was a German invasion that was feared. For example, files of Irish men who enlisted in the Royal Air Force were destroyed. Their relations in Ireland could be traced from those files and uh, they would come to uh, no good uh, by an occupying uh, German army. Uh, at a higher level then, members of the Irish Defence Forces who had visited the Admiralty in 1938-39 to set up the Coast Watching Service or to discuss British-Irish security cooperation. Files too on um, Ireland's refusal to allow German airline Lufthansa to operate transatlantic flights from Ireland in the late 1930s. There's one file, and we simply don't know what it's about, 119 bar 16, totally destroyed, and the page was cut out of the registry itself, that document I'm showing you the picture of there. Other areas in which material was destroyed included citizenship, aliens, visas, military matters. But then there were large areas left untouched, such as international sporting events, tourist traffic, almost all the trade section files remained intact. Most intriguing of the files that I found that were destroyed was at number 115 bar 460. And that's a, a file that contained a single document from the Garda Commissioner's Office, which covered an alleged campaign by Jews in Ireland to boycott German goods. And we know nothing about the content of that or whether it was a crank letter or whether there was just what it means at, at all. So by way of conclusion, I want to quickly look at what we lost regarding Germany. Uh, Ireland's minister to Berlin from 1933 to 39 was the pro-Nazi anti-Semite Charles Bewley. And some of you may be aware of his absolutely ghastly report on Crystal Lock that shows how his mind had been corrupted by uh, Nazi racial policies and, and anti-Semitic policies. But we see here from one of his files of confidential reports, the kind of documents that were obliterated in the flames in the incinerator in government buildings. Um, documents on the Anschluss, on the Munich crisis and the German uh, Czech situation leading up, up to it, uh, anti-Jewish feeling in, in Czechoslovakia, uh, regulations governing the admission of Jews into Germany, really important 
chapters uh, in the history of Irish foreign policy that we simply know nothing about because of the uh, destruction of the records. So by way of conclusion, uh, I hope I've shown you something about the, the haphazard nature of uh, state paper preservation in Ireland in the run-up to the Second World War. Uh, hopefully some of them, uh, some of the illustrations I've given have been at least humorous, if not worrying in terms of the uh, type of protection that was given. Uh, or not given in, in cases. I moved very quickly past there towards the end. We can talk about it in the questions if, if need be, the destruction of the Irish embassy, the Irish legation in Berlin during the Second World War, uh, uh, during uh, an air raid. But I think what I'll bring this to a conclusion by saying is that the rumors, the stories of widespread destruction of files uh, were untrue. That destruction can be catalogued, circa 150 files, the destruction, however, was significant because of the high level nature of the material uh, that was destroyed, but it wasn't as widespread as was feared by some. Um, files on headquarters that were destroyed, sometimes the embassy series in the National Archives can overcome some of the gaps because of that uh, matter that the, uh, the Treasury referred to earlier, that if a file is in one location, there may be a copy of a document in another. Some of the material destroyed from London uh, was actually copies of it were discovered uh, during the uh, renovation works on the embassy in 2005, in particular some of the destroyed confidential reports. But we still have significant gaps, uh, particularly uh, the confidential reports from Berlin, I mentioned a few moments ago, and the destruction of the uh, of components of the S series secretary's files, not to be confused with the Dishik's department files I mentioned earlier, which are also a series. The destruction of the S-series secretary's files really does remain a problem for trying to understand uh, high-level policy in, in the 1930s. There certainly are gaps there. And there's one big unknown in this as well, and it's something I, I can't answer. Um, Boland's discussions with Sir John Maffey suggested that perhaps other departments had also been involved in this uh, process of incineration, uh, possibly the Department of Industry and Commerce was destroying files because of what they would have shown also about relations with, uh, with Britain. So I, I leave it there. I, I hope this has shown how you can kind of use historical methodology and archival methodology, not just to write the history of something that is there, but as in this case, to, to write the history of something that is not there, of which we only have uh, a footprint and uh, ideas of, of, of ashes and, and documents going up in smoke, but at least a partial reconstruction is, is, is possible. And maybe you could draw a parallel in a small way with some of the uh, work that's going on in the Beyond 2022 project uh, that is trying to reconstruct the materials that were destroyed in the Public Record Office fire uh, at the beginning of the Civil War. So thank you all very much. And I will uh, hand back to Elizabeth now. Uh, thank you very, very much. Um, if you could just stop the share there for a sec, Michael, thank you very much. There we go. Super, thank you very much. Uh, well, on behalf of um, myself and Adam in the National Archives, uh, thank you for an absolutely riveting talk tonight. Um, Michael, a uh, re really fascinating, uh, sorry, <laughs> There we go. Fascinating insight into the preparations to protect the records of state in the late 1930s and early 1940s and to get behind the truth behind the destruction of those departmental uh, files from the Department of External Affairs. Um, while we can, of course, lament the destruction uh, of the, the records, it is, I suppose, slightly comforting to know that the scale of it wasn't as serious perhaps as, as was feared in the, in the past. We have about maybe, maybe less than 10 minutes for, for Q&A. The Q&A box has been extremely busy as reflects the, um, the, uh, the, the nature of the talk and, and how fascinating it was. Uh, we've got a question here from Liam Kenny, Michael. Uh, can Michael tell us anything about preparations made to relocate the government outside Dublin? Ah, can I? Um, very little, I'm afraid, Liam. It's something I'd love to look at. And if there's any students out there, there is a PhD in this, um, looking at emergency planning. Um, I, I'm thinking of Leonor Brin's memoirs, where he talks about regional commissioners being set up uh, to look after particular areas. Um, I don't know about where uh, departments would be decentralised to, 
but I, I know that there were that the planning in external affairs included is those boxes that I referred to that all the apparatus that a department would need to, to run itself remotely, um, the kind of disaster recovery planning that we call it now, I guess, but there was a, a kind of primitive attempt at that undertaken. But I don't know if, as you know, was the story in the, the 1970s and 1980s, it was the bunker in Mullingar or the bunker in Athlone or I mean, the, where the government was actually going to, to relocate to or whether they'd be caught in Dublin uh, by the invading forces if it was the Germans. Uh, and then, of course, there's the, the, the question of where do you decentralize to uh, if the invasion comes from across the border? So I'm not sure, but I would suspect, and I'm, I'm guessing here based on what the defense forces do, that the defense forces planning for uh, operations in the field uh, to have commander field forces who would lead the defense forces against the invading army was to occupy large houses. Um, I'm thinking of um, some of the stately homes up near the border or, uh, and I can't remember the name, but it's, it's now a hotel out near Maynooth. One of their carton domain was going to be one of the areas, probably a little close to Dublin. So sorry, Liam, I, I can't give you any, any more than that. I would love to know. Hey, thanks very much, Michael. We have a question here from Apollo O'Greer. Was there any set of files or a list of Jewish nationals uh, destroyed as part of the, um, the destruction in May, 1940? Now, you would have to look at the, um, the appendix in, in DIFP. I, I, I don't know about that. Um, it would not surprise me if that was the case. Uh, but then the work that Dermot Keo did on the Jewish community in Ireland showed that he was able to get, uh, get his hands on quite a bit of material there, files from the time. I, I think more Department of Justice maybe uh, G2 records, and I know uh, from uh, my, my, my own experience that there are in G2 records in military archives, but I think they are closed for recataloging at the moment, uh, the kind of lists that you're, you're talking about. Uh, I know because I, I saw them oh, 20 years ago when they were open and they will be open again, showing that sort of material. So lists like that do exist. Um, and they are still available, but were they destroyed in, in the Department of Foreign Affairs? I am not certain because I would need to check the list, which is there behind me. Uh, and uh, I'm not going to be rude to everyone asking questions, picking up the book and putting it up in front of the screen to check. So th there is a location you can check. So thanks for that question. You're, you're right, Michael, in relation to the aliens files, there is definitely um, the applications for a status known as the aliens files within the Department of Justice. Um, there are certain, it gives you a, a, some idea as to the number of not only Jews who were applying, a, actually there is Cyril Cusick comes up in them. He was born in Durban in South Africa. So he is applying for, for citizenship, uh, citizenship status. And so is Ib Jorgensen, uh, the, um, I think the, the Danish painter. Um, right, we have lots of complimentary comments here about thank you. Thank you for a fascinating talk. Joseph Quinn has a question here, and I know you referred briefly to it earlier, Michael. Um, are there any further details on the files of those Irish nationals who joined the RAF? Was this the fate of files of individuals who joined the British forces generally, especially those who were vetted by the Department of Justice for the War Officer Admiralty? Well, hello, Joseph. If it's Joseph, who I know from Trinity, very good to, to hear from you. Um, now, I have not seen uh, any files like that, and I know I'd be looking out for them because I have some relations who did just as, as you described. Um, I think they were amongst the files that were, were destroyed. Uh, they'd be, but then of course, you're, you're also looking at people who joined up um, during the war. Uh, and I have not for a long time seen files like that. One of the reasons why not is that there's another level of destruction that, um, that, that I didn't mention. And that's that the, the High Commission in, in London uh, at the time was based on Regent Street, uh, not the portion of Regent Street that you all know from, from shopping. But if you were standing at the, the Era statue in Piccadilly and walked down towards, you'd see Big Ben in the distance and, and, uh, and that down that section, that's where the High Commission was. And its basement was below the waterline of the Thames. So in the 50s, there was a flood and the material I think that you're talking about there, Joseph, that kind of material on the British side was destroyed. 
uh, the British side, but in an Irish state building was destroyed. So you're really looking at, um, at shards of information there at, at individual levels. And um, I think all of the people, nearly all of the people concerned would, would be dead now. So there might not be, I mean, there'll be some data protection issues, but there, I'm not an expert on that. Um, so really that, that is needle in a haystack stuff. Um, thank you, Michael. There is a comment here by Ray Kennedy, who uh, was asking uh, about Charles Bewley looking at his photograph again. I think we can all be forgiven for doing a double take when uh, the photograph of Charles Bewley uh, popped up there. He bore a striking resemblance to um, the leader of the country he was based in at the time. <laughs> uh, we really don't have... Uh, the opportunity to bring up his photograph again but um michael would you be able to advise is there a biography written of charles bewley or mm -hmm. because sorry Pawdy certainly makes the point perhaps the destruction charles bewley's reports from berlin save us a whole lot of embarrassment well <laughs> well i i think there's, there's one thing that you know thankfully we're a democracy and it's what we said for germany at the time although Hitler was i suppose elected um the the files that were there that were destroyed, yeah, they, I think there would have been a lot that was embarrassing there, but it's part of a, a democracy that the uh, government officials are, are held accountable, that there's transparency and that the material is out there in the public domain. And it's something that we try to do in documents in Irish foreign policy is show material uh, like that, that it, it, this is not a fairy tale. Things go really, now there are tragic chapters in the history of Irish foreign policy, over the overseas adoption of infants being one. Um, Charles Bewley is um, really a, a disgrace, but we have to understand so much about Bewley as to why he was appointed. And I, I don't want to be sounding like an apology apologist for him. Actually, some of his reports from the early 30s were very, very good on the nature of understanding centres of power within the, the, the Nazi state. Uh, it was by, I think, 1935-36, he'd, he'd, he'd gone native. He'd gone, he was always anti-Semitic. He was always an extremely... Uh, nasty individual, but his politics are becoming increasingly warped. Now, um, is there a biography of him? There is um, a, a wonderful book by an academic, Andreas Roth, and I don't know where Andreas is, is now in terms of his career, but this was um, a book published uh, called Mr. Bewley in Berlin. I think it was an MA dissertation, really on a really brilliant MA dissertation, and very unusual for an MA to be published, but it was superb. It looked at the, um, the German side of Bewley and what Bewley did during the war, his involvement with the German intelligence services and how he was nearly executed by the Allies at the end of the war. Then there's Bewley's own memoirs, uh, Memoirs of a Wild Goose, where he, he tones down his anti-Semitism, uh, where he, I mean, he is an objectionable character. You, you wouldn't want to go for a pint with him or anything. Uh, there is just something incre incredibly nasty about the man, um, pompous, arrogant, and that comes across from his memoirs. Uh, I think there's also a, an unedited draft at Trinity College in the archives. And some of the work by John Duggan um, on uh, Ireland and the Third Reich will cover Bewley as, as well. Uh, Mervyn O'Driscoll's book, um, Ireland, is it Ireland and Nazi Germany, I think it's called, that will also in, include, a, in, include a Bewley. But if you want to get a real flavor of what a nasty piece of work he is, uh, go onto the DIFP website and find his uh, report on Crystal Knock, and it is a shameful uh, piece of work. It's been in the public domain for close on 30 years now, but it, it will put a shiver down everyone, everyone's spine who reads it. It's, it's a disgusting piece of writing. And it shows why he was fired by the Department of External Affairs uh, in the end, uh, and fired. The purpose of him being fired was that he would lose his pension rights, and uh, he would no longer be a burden on the state, and he was effectively done away with by, by Fred Boland, who I mentioned earlier. And was he uh, fired, Michael? Yeah, he was told to report back to Dublin to take up a lower rank uh, in the department. And he said, saw that, and uh, he refused to turn up. And um, by doing so, he had disobeyed an order effectively and was declared absent without leave, was fired and spent the war time coming in and out of Germany, but resident in Rome. Um, his passport is in the archives. It's one of the wonderful... Uh, documents there was captured at the end of the war and it shows his travels and uh, the department kind of 
kept an eye on him, but he was of independent means. Uh, he was speaking of biographies. There's one claim to fame, if it be called that, is he has written what is still the best-selling biography of Hermann Goering. Uh, he was a friend of Goering's. Right. And, and the, the, the department kind of made peace with them uh, just a year before he died. I think he died in 68 or 69. They invited him to a Patrick's Day reception at the embassy in Rome and he turned up and um, that was that. But a really, really objectionable individual. Actually, so, long winded yeah. answer there to the questions. Not at all. Uh, thank you to Pauline Conway, who had said Mr. Bewley in Berlin is very well worth reading. And thank you also to Mary Kenny. He says that Charles Bewley's nephew lives in Dublin, or London, if still alive and was well informed about him. I'm sure he was. We'll take two more questions, if that's OK, Michael, because I'm just yeah, conscious I'm of time. Yeah, sure. um, from uh, Erskine Childers, uh, an Erskine Childers account. Thank you very much for fascinating talk. His question or her question is in relation to Walsh's S files, 1920 to 1930. Were there any indexes? of the subject titles of these burned files that survive. Uh, hello, that's uh, Erskine from Twitter. Very good to, to, to talk to you. And uh, thanks for all the, the comments and the retweets and that over the over the years. Um, there is no index to the S files. I, I tried to make one myself and um, try to look at what's there and know that the, 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 the index that's there is the index of the just the files as the collection is extant now but um, there are gaps in it. I was able to fill in maybe 10 or 15 files in it, but there are huge gaps in the late 1930s. So um, there isn't, it's still a mystery. And finally from anonymous attendee, uh, could you tell us again where the files relating to the moving of artworks from the National Gallery are today? Great talk, I'm fascinated. Oh, so thank you. Um, they are in the National Archives today. Uh, they are, let me look at my footnotes, because um, I actually had to reconstruct this paper myself. Uh, it was the victim of a hard drive crash way back. So the, the version I have here, the footnotes are all over the place. I had to scan it. Um, Department of the Taoiseach, S11064. Department of Finance. Um, oh, there they are. We're looking at as well finance supply series files, uh, Department of Foreign Affairs files. So I, I think what you're looking at are, are basically files on air raid precautions, emergency planning, um, and Elizabeth, you and your colleagues should be able to help. Anonymous guest yeah. user there uh, uh, make themselves known. And uh, there's there's nothing here that I, I use that somebody who went into the National Archives wouldn't be able to access very, very quickly uh, and, and work it in together. And I think, I, I don't know if there are um, files available in the, the cultural institutions about their own operations. One, one point I, I didn't mention here was that uh, up to, gosh, I don't remember how many years ago I was a member of the Irish Manuscripts Commission and the, uh, the commission's own papers are in, in the National Archives and they show the commission getting involved because that's its remit to, to try and undo the damage done by the destruction of the four courts and protect uh, papers, that there is so much material in the Commission's own archive about what I'm looking at here today, so this, this evening. So I'm hoping that in the, 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 the registries of the, the cultural institutions, there might be similar material here, perhaps also in, in the railway companies, you mentioned the Great Southern Railways. And um, it's the kind of topic that I think if you're looking in, in, in local archives and personal archives, it'll be one document here, one document there, piece them all together and, and the, the story uh, becomes apparent. But there is at least, I would say, surely uh, a study to be done on emergency planning in the Second World War. And there is uh, definitely one to be done for planning for World War III. Uh, I know, um, and I cannot remember his name, but there was a, a historian in Queens um, uh, who was, uh, I met him in Belfast some years ago, who had written the equivalent for Northern Ireland as part of the, the, the UK emergency planning functions. And um, Peter Hennessy's book, the, the Secret State, which deals with emergency planning in Britain uh, in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, up to the, the near present, has passing references to Ireland in it as well. So that, you know, if you're looking for material to, to look at, the, at paintings and so on, um, spread the net widely and you, you will find something. For all we know, Colossus de Wera in Termakidi may have something, or there may be somebody down there. That uh, that poor chap who was sent down to mine the papers may have may have left an account somewhere for all we know. Uh, so uh, feel of pain. 
I'd, I'd recommend to uh, the anonymous attendee there and um, also to head on to our online catalog on nationalarchives.ie do uh, just a regular keyword search for national gallery and and see what comes up you can also use the advanced search of course too um, but certainly as michael says it would be one place to uh play, place to start and um, okay maybe one more michael if that's okay yeah, sure. I'm, look, you're, you're the boss i'm happy to go on <laughs> well, I'm just conscious of uh, conscious of time. I don't want to trespass on your your That's, your patience. Um, where would I be going? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> anyway, this the, the, this is true. Okay, um, hmm. right. There is a, a another question. I think from the same anonymous attendee. What was happening in uh, Saint Jean de Luz? Why was it listed as the name on some of the files for destruction? We know if it's the same anonymous person. Um, um, why was it there? That was because the Irish legation in Madrid uh, moved to Saint Jean de Luz on the outbreak of the Spanish Civil War, and it was based there for the duration of the, the, the conflict. And then, if memory serves, Leopold Carney, who's our our, um, our minister in in Madrid, moved back to Madrid. I cannot remember the date off the top of my head. He he'd been um, he, I think, was suffering or had, had caught polio on the outbreak of the, the Spanish Civil War. Not related, but it was a, a, a disease uh, at the time that was um, well rampant. And uh, he was recovering in San Jean de Luz, I think. But certainly, the, no, the diplomatic corps in Madrid relocated, I think, to San, San Jean de Luz. And um, that was why that was there. OK, well, just again, Michael, on behalf of the audience and of the National Archives, I'd like to thank you very much again for your absolutely stimulating and absorbing talk tonight. Any final words of wisdom for us? Oh, no, I just want to say thank you very much uh, for everyone who attended. And it was uh, lovely to get a chance to, uh, to to give this paper and also to some of the people there in the questions. So uh, we've crossed our, we've, our paths across over the years and we've we've, uh, we've been in touch. So it's, it's, it's lovely to even down the whatever camera tube this is to uh, people as well. So thank you all very much. Uh, there'd be no paper to give if there weren't attendees at it. So uh, thank you for um, for being there. Um, thanks, Michael. I'd also like to thank you, our audience, uh, for tuning in to tonight's talk and for engaging with with the topic in, in such a, a lively a lively manner. Um, our next online public lecture will take place on the 23rd of March. Uh, it will relate to genealogy, specifically civil registration. So uh, do keep an eye out on our Twitter account for further information and booking details. We'll be putting those on a uh, possibly next week or the week after. So thank you again for joining us. Uh, wishing you all a very enjoyable weekend and uh, good night. Thank you. <laughs>